Hello and welcome to On Point. My name is Rory O'Sullivan. Today we're going to tackle greed, its place in human nature and its role in our society. Joining me is Reverend James Lawson, civil rights leader and a visiting lecturer on CSUN's campus this year. And I also have economics professor, Dr. Shirley Savorny. Reverend Lawson, um, what is the history of greed throughout mankind? Oh, I don't know if I can talk about the history of greed at can, all. Can you talk about some of the religious aspects, some of the religious history? Yes, I can. Uh, the, um, in Christianity, is such a thing as classic sin, and greed is one of the seven um, categories of, of, of sin that has a long history in, down into the present moment. So greed is not counted in that kind of ethical understanding as being a virtue, it is seen as, as sin. And part of that is rooted in our scriptures, where as an example in First uh, Timothy 6 chapter, the 10th verse, there's that fairly famous verse that says that uh, the love of money uh, is the root of all evil. Uh, and over the years as I've worked in the society and in congregation for change, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I'm not going to say it's an absolute truth, but there's a lot of truth in it. Then you have in uh, the Jewish studies in a book called uh, Ecclesiasticus by a man by the name of Jesus of Sirach, who was a maybe a hundred and 80 years before Jesus of Nazareth, Sirach says that the, the person who pursues gold never gets satisfaction, and he who seeks for profit is going to be corrupted, <laughs> um, something like that. But uh, the, the point is that we, you know, Ethically and religiously, we do not see greed as a plus. So I guess the next question would be, where is the limit supposed to be? How do you put a limit? On, on personal wealth. Where, where should the limit be on personal wealth, on personal gain? Um, I mean, there is no limit, is there? Uh, <laughs> J. Paul Getty, who was once the richest pan in the world who was getting something like 250 or 60 million dollars a day profit in the, in the sort of zenith of his life, was asked by a reporter, when do you have, uh, uh, when do you get, when do you have enough? And, and I think J, I know J, uh, uh, Paul Getty said more, more. So where, where do you, where, I mean, he already had more than he could ever spend, and more than was necessary for family, more than was necessary for investments. He already had vastly more than that. So when do you get enough? And some, some elements, it seems to me, today in our economy um, talk as though the accumulation of wealth and the concomitant power is a legitimate goal. Uh, I do not see that, but there are people who do. I guess, Dr. Zavorny, I want to get you in here. Um, first, do you feel that greed actually exists? That that... That greed exists? Yes. I do think that greed exists. So I guess, who should set the limits? Because Reverend Lawson said that the government should set limits. Who do you feel should set the limits, and where should those limits be set? I, I don't think greed is a bad thing. I think it can be a bad thing, but it can be a really powerful force for bringing people out of poverty. And so um, it may be a matter of semantics to say that something is greed or something is just self-motivation to feed your family. So when you, when you look at it that way, I see, when we were talking about Getty and Getty's wanting motivation to make more money, but from society's point of view, his efforts, his investments made it so lots of people had jobs and so a lot of people could feed their families. 
Yes, but I think you'd have to show me a specific example where somebody's greed advanced the human cause. I th we're, we have to be talking semantics now, right? Big bird. We ha this has to be semantics, right? Because, I mean, certainly everybody who comes up with an invention is is greedy for either um, acknowledgement or success. No, or I, I think most inventors have had a keen curiosity about life and uh, a willingness to explore what's going on that they could observe and how it runs and right. how it's managed and how it can be har uh, harnessed for human. This was certainly a Thomas Edi Edison. Uh, this certainly is part of the reason uh, scientists in the last 30 years have been able to unravel the whole genetic scheme of, of life for us. A lot of invention has come from people not out to make money, but people out to get become more aware of the so, world. So you're tying greed with money, right? You're not so success and achievement are going for success and achievement are not greed. Greed no, is wanting greed. material things. Greed is the love of money as material a source things, of things because money uh, is not. Yeah, right. the greed is the love of money, which helps a person have a sense of who they are and which also helps persons to gain a sense of power and influence. But you so could use I that power link. and influence for a good you thing, You could, right? but it has not been. That's not true. No. You could, I mean, no. you can't say that no one's used well, power and influence as a good illustration? thing. I mean, well, in, in the American scene in the last hundred years, where the wealth has, has just grown beyond imagination and the inequality between the wealthy and the poverty, the inequity gaps have increased, and many folk have pointed that out. You cannot show me where, say, the banking interests, the investment companies' interests, the Wall Street companies in the last 30 years have petitioned Congress for that which helps the well being of the 300 million people who are members of our country. Well, actually, I could tell you that, that okay. the way that they do. So uh, what happens is they go to Congress and they want um, bank deregulation. And bank deregulation makes financial intermediation, where you, take, where you help money go into uh, profitable ventures and uh, things that uh, create goods and services that people want to buy. So you could, you could say that bank deregulation led to the uh, ability of banks to improve uh, the increase the number of investments that could be made in society and that investments increase the um, the productivity of labor and that's what's brought the um, poorest families and, and the least skilled workers to the level of living that they have now because these investments were made. No, it, it also I would disagree with that. I would disagree outright with no. that. Huh? Outright no. I would disagree no. with that very clearly. One of the things that allowed this country to create a, a large sizable middle class and to begin to eradicate a great deal of poverty uh, was the development of labor unions. The labor unions that lifted salaries at 1910 from 10 cents an hour for making shoes to seven dollars an hour, it took them a long time, but that's what allowed many, many people to acquire a kind of a middle class, middle class income and to acquire property and send their kids to school. I grew up in the... Can I address that issue yes, first? Yes, right. There's no way the firms could have paid them that much if their productivity hadn't grown over that time. Yes, but it was their labor that created the productivity. The productivity the, comes from having more capital and no, no, it does productivity not. I increases. I disagree. I mean... So if you have, no, a, if you have a sewing machine, you're no more productive I'm than without do something one? something that I've almost never done before. I'm going to quote Karl Marx, with whom I bitterly disagree. Okay. Karl Marx who says that capital comes from labor. It comes from working. 